Here we're going to do some more practice problems on limits as they approach infinity. I'm going to show the first example in complete detail and then we'll start taking some shortcuts. But there are some more challenging problems towards the end of this video that use more than just simple division. You'd have to use other functions and stuff for comparison. So uh, if the first question is too easy for you, don't worry, there's something a little bit more challenging at the end. Okay. First thing we want to do is find, we want to find the limit as x approaches infinity of x minus x root x over 2x to the 3 halves. The first thing we want to do is convert everything into rational powers. So I want to take this x to the root x and I want to convert this to a uh, power with a fraction in it. So this is the same thing as x to the 1 times x to the 1 half. So if we want to get a common denominator here, this would be x to the 2 over 2, that's the same thing as x to the 1, multiplied by x to the 1 half. When we multiply powers, we add the power together. So this is the same thing as x to the 3 halves. By now, hopefully you can do that in your head without writing it out step by step, but you know, if this is review for you, it might be a nice thing to have. So let's rewrite this. This is now the same thing as the limit as x approaches infinity of x minus x to the 3 halves over 2x to the 3 halves. Okay, uh, at this point we could just do something really simple. We could just look at the highest power in the numerator and the denominator and compare how fast they grow. So these grow at the same speed, so we're likely going to get a uh, numerical limit. In fact, we will get a numerical limit. So just to show you that, we would end up with negative 3 halves over uh, 2x to the 3 halves. And if we simplify this, we're going to end up with negative 1 half. So this will be our limit, but let's show this algebraically. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to divide every single term by the highest power in either the numerator or the denominator. So in this case, the highest power in our function is x to the 3 halves, so we're going to divide every single term by x to the 3 halves. So this is going to be x over x to the 3 halves minus x to the 3 halves over x to the 3 halves all divided by 2x to the 3 halves over x to the 3 halves. Okay, so this will be the same thing as the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over x to the 1 half minus 1, because x to the 3 halves over x to the 3 halves cancel. And this will be over well, 2x to the 3 halves divided by x to the 3 halves is just 2. So at this point now, we can evaluate. We know that 1 over x to the 1 half is going to tend to 0 because the denominator is growing more quickly than the numerator. The numerator is not growing at all, it's a constant. So this ratio is going to tend towards 0. And then constants, well, they don't have variables, so these won't change. So this is just the same thing as 0 minus 1 over 2, which gives us our limit at negative 1 half. So this will be our horizontal asymptote for the function, as well as our limit as x approaches infinity. So now, and from now on, I'm just going to compare the highest power if it's a simple polynomial. And this isn't really a trick. This is just an understanding of functions and function growth. The limit as x approaches infinity depends on the ratio of the numerator and the denominator. So if the denominator is growing uh, bigger at a faster rate than the numerator, then the ratio tends towards zero. If the numerator grows faster than the, than the denominator, then of course the function is going to get bigger and bigger as the ratio gets bigger and bigger. So then we'd either get an infinity or negative infinity. It's only when the numerator and the denominator grow at the same rate that we end up with a numerical value for our limit. So here we go. Let's find the limit as x approaches infinity of root x squared plus 1. Okay, so the intuition, what you would probably do is you'd think something like, well, this is the same thing as infinity squared plus 1, and we take the square root. So this is going to be really big, so this is just infinity. Okay, your intuition is good, but this isn't a, a full explanation of what happens. So what we'll do here is we're going to think a little bit, and we're going to try to... Uh, bound this function. So what do we know the limit of? Well, here's what we know. 
we know that if we just had the square root of x squared, this would be x. And we know that the limit as x approaches infinity of x uh, tends towards infinity. This is a definitional thing that we have. So how does x squared plus 1 relate to it? Well, here's the thing. We know that the square root of x squared plus 1 is going to be greater or equal to the square root of x squared. Okay, it's a bigger function. So if we take, for example, uh, x equals 0, then we end up with 0 is less than or equal to root 1. If we pick x equals 2, uh, then we end up with uh, the square root of 4 being less than or equal to... Uh, sorry, if we pick x equals 2, yeah, then this would be greater, less than or equal to the square root of 5. So x squared plus 1 is always going to grow slightly faster than the square root of x squared. Okay, but if this, the square root of x squared, tends towards infinity, then we know that the square root of x squared plus 1 has to be greater or equal to the square root of x squared. So in other words, uh, this function here is always going to be larger than the square root of x squared. So because the square root of x squared tends towards infinity, we know the square root of x squared plus 1 has to be larger than that. So that is also going to tend towards infinity. So this requires a little bit more work because we have to compare it to a function that we already know to prove this. Okay. Here's another example, but this is a little bit different because now we're introducing trig. And the first thing you would ask yourself is, well, what is the limit as x approaches infinity of sine x squared? And then you could answer the question. But that's difficult, all right? We don't know that yet. But here's what we do know. Let's take a look at sine x squared. Well, what do we know about the values of sine x? We know that these values have to be somewhere between uh, negative 1 and 1, because that's what the sine curve does, is it? Uh, bounces between negative 1 and 1. So when we square this, what we end up with is that sine x squared is going to be less than or equal to 1, but also greater or equal to 0. So sine x squared is somewhere between 0 and 1. Okay? We, we know that because any value of x we put in for sine x and we square it, it'll give us somewhere between 0 and 1. You can check this on your own with the calculator, but this is good intuition to get. Okay, so that means that we can actually compare this function, sine x squared over 1 plus x squared, to something that we would know. So we can compare it to the function 1 over 1 plus x squared. Now there's something that we know. We know that the function 1 over 1 plus x squared is always going to be greater or equal to sine x squared over 1 plus x squared. Now how do we know this? Well, we know this because sine x squared is going to be somewhere between 0 and 1. So zero, somewhere between 0 and 1 is always going to be less than or equal to just 1 itself. So what we can do now is we can evaluate the limit on the right. So the limit as 1 over 1 plus x squared, let's just put in some values for x. If x equals 0, we get 1 over 1. If x is equal to, say, 2, we would get uh, 1 over 1 plus 2 squared, which is 5. If we put x equals 3, we would get 1 over 10. So as this continues, this is going to tend towards 0. Well, what do we know about uh, sine x squared over 1 plus x squared, well, this is always going to be smaller than or equal to. So, this is going to be less than or equal to 0. But we don't want this to be negative infinity, right? So we have to bind this. But what do we know? So here's the second trick we have to bring in. We understand the fact that sine x squared is always going to be greater than or equal to 0. So what that also means is that this curve sine x squared over 1 plus x squared is always going to be greater or equal to 0 over 1 plus x squared. But what is that? That just gives us 0. 
So it's going to be between 0 and 1 over 1 plus x squared. So if we take a look at this, this is sort of a, a dumb comparison I'm doing here. But as x grows bigger, uh, we also find that 0 does not grow any bigger. So what this means is that this curve, sine x squared over 1 plus x squared, has to be between 0 and 0 because a function smaller than it tends to zero and a function bigger than it tends to zero. Therefore, as this goes down, this function will also tend towards zero. So uh, this is a case of something known as the squeeze theorem. Uh, you might also have heard this uh, as the sandwich theorem. I hear squeeze theorem a lot in Canada. But I'm pretty sure it depends on your instructor, whoever, you know, whatever you grew up with. I grew up with squeeze theorem, so I use squeeze theorem. If you grew up with sandwich theorem, you use sandwich theorem. I'm sure there's some other names too, uh, but these are the two most common ones. Okay, so this compares a function bigger, a function smaller, and then it constrains the middle function by looking at sort of what the limits are on both sides. Okay, that's a more difficult question, for sure. Here's the last one. Let's find the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over e, to, well, sorry, 1 minus e to the x over 1 plus 2 e to the x. Now, this question is not as hard as the previous one. What's important to note is, of course, function growth. Let's not forget about function growth. On the numerator, the fastest growing thing is minus e to the x. So we're going to get negative e to the x on top. In the denominator, the fastest growing thing is 2 e to the x. So we end up with 2e to the x on bottom. If we simplify this, we get negative 1 half. So this is going to be our limit as x approaches infinity of 1 minus e to the x over 1 plus 2e to the x. But for all you, all you uh, algebraic nuts out there, let's do this step by step. So what we're going to do is we're going to divide numerator and denominator by the highest power here. So the fastest growing thing is e to the x. So we're going to divide everything by e to the x. This will be 1 over e to the x minus e to the x over e to the x. And this is all over 1 over e to the x plus 2 e to the x over e to the x. Now what we're going to do is we're going to simplify this. So this is the limit as x approaches infinity of, well, 1 over e to the x can't be changed here. Uh, we're going to subtract 1 because e to the x over e to the x is equal to 1. 1 over e to the x won't change. And then 2 e to the x over e to the x will simplify to 2. Now if we take a look at each of these individually, well, 1 over e to the x. e to the x is growing quick very fast. So this ratio is going 10 towards 0 because the numerator is staying the same while the denominator is growing large very quick. And this will be the same on the bottom. So what we end up with is 0 minus 1 over 0 plus 2. And this is equal to negative one half. So again, this understanding up top is all related to how you understand function growth. If you understand function growth, you can take this shortcut. It's not a trick, it's a shortcut. Uh, if you don't quite get that yet, you do the algebraic approach and you divide everything by the steps and eventually you'll find out using all your rules what the solution is. So if you have any questions, leave them below and hopefully me or someone else can get to you.